Norwegian Education in the Long 19th Century. This is a one school for all lecture by me, Andrew Thomas, at the Esfold University College for my wonderful international students that I want you to watch um, by next Tuesday, the 11th of September 2018. Um, so the long 19th century is uh, is a phrase by Hobsbawm. It's, um, it's basically referring to what happened just before the 1800s and just after the 1800s and everything in between. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the place of education in this. The, um, I'm going to outline a few a few developments in that in that period so that we can then you go on to use that, this as a context when we're analysing developments in educational history in Norway. So um, first of all, um, the 1800s is a time of, of liberalisation and there's a lot of different things that we mean by that. Um, first of all, um, a process that started really in the 1600s um, classes are much less important um, and they become less and less important. Um, uh, the um, big roles are taken by in, in government and, um, and society are taken by um, bureaucrats, maybe certainly people who are um, able to do these things rather than um, allied and they're allied less and less to um, the aristocratic um, areas of the world the aristocratic world. The same goes specifically for the markets. There's a, a number of things that um, um, go towards making the markets more open in this in this period. It's a period of gentrification in many ways, gentrification of the rural classes um, and, um, and markets um, which were an urban thing at the beginning of the um, or at the beginning of the 1800s are become available to people who are living in the villages um, as of the early, um, well about the 1830s. Also, there are more and more towns that are getting better status and so that are allowed to um, trade. So trade is becoming more and more possible throughout this um, century. At the same time, um, le um, it's becoming tolerant. So you don't have to be um, beautiful and clever and um, aristocratic in order to um, get acceptance in the um, in society. In fact, you've got to be pretty bad in order to be thrown out of society at this point, um, at the end of this mess, uh, of this century. Um, which is to say, there's a, an increasing tolerance both of um, un, unnormal um, pupils that we uh, we know that there are um, more and more facilities for um, for pupils who don't um, fit into um, the standard categories that the beginning of the century um, uh, would have defined them as. Um, um, but also um, religiously. Um, and morally, um, we see a, a, an increased moralization of, um, of, of, of discussions, but, um, but society itself does not rule these people out. So at the beginning of the century, you would lock up an all, awful lot of people like lay preachers and, um, and people of dubious morals. At the end of the century, uh, you don't lock them up. You treat them in particular ways. Also, um, this is uh, and this is a, a piece with just general less investment in the country um, at the beginning of the century. Um, a lot the state actually took part in in the market. It would actually um, sponsor um, economic activities. Um, in addition to it spending lots of money on these um, locking up situations, so uh, of course, and in and D workhouses. At the end of the century, um, the state doesn't really invest in um, in things in order to earn money. Um, so there's much less economic investment in society, and of course, because of this in uh, this tolerance, there's much less things like workhouses and stuff like that. This comes alongside with um, um, an increase in knowledge. At the beginning of the 1800s, um, deaths and births were were um, largely the um, regime, the, the responsibility of priests. It's um, parishes that um, that note when people are born and die and married and everything like that. In the course of the century, the, all of this responsibility of knowing what's going on in society is handed over to experts in statistical knowledge state statistics. Um, in a, so we've got parishes who form the social units, um, which are replaced by municipalities and a steadily more political division of the country, but also who actually, not only um, how it's organised in a religious to secular way, but also who actually takes part in the, in the counting of people. It's gone from a religious matter to a secular matter. 
that's the um, official and that's the public um, aspect of it. Of course, there are also private numbers and banks and insurance companies um, em emerge as extremely important agents in working out statistics about how often people are sick, how often criminal um, crime takes place, how often, how often accidents are going to take place, because that's part of what insurance companies are. And they become professional insurance companies in the course of the 1800s. So actuarial knowledge is what we call that. Um, insurance statistics and um, and so we've got mathematical knowledge going alongside um, less state investment but more tolerance so you can see this is um, more knowledge about society but less um, um, but less restrictions within that um, situation okay let's move on to um, education itself um, educational reform. So whilst the general tendency in the course of the 1800s is less and less investment, certainly in economical situations, but also um, traditional things that states would invest in, um, the um, school is the big exception to that. School and health is actually the biggest exception to that. Um, there are um, There is more investment in schools. It goes from being a religious thing and an urban thing to uh, um, to being a more secular thing. It's not just general secularization. It's also the religious studies is no longer the only subject in schools. In the 1700s, religious uh, schools were basically there for the church to, um, to prepare people for confirmation. In the 1800s, um, it's not just religious studies and it's not just all about Jesus, it's about history and geography and maths and writing and reading. So um, so there's more, um, so there's investment in schools, unlike the increase in investment in the rest of the country, and there's a, an, um, a wider school subject. Also, that includes uh, the inclusion. A lot of people were ruled out of schools in the in the um, when schools were introduced in Norway in the 1500s. It was purely for um, a, um, a city thing. There were there wasn't there weren't any schools in the countryside. Um, that's that's less the case in the 1700s. The church wants to educate absolutely everybody, but in the 1800s, um, it's not just the church that's educating; it's the state that wants to educate everybody, and that means everybody, not just. Um, um, not just pe rich people, not just people who can afford it, um, but also not just um, n not just working people. It's also, like I said before, the people that would have been ruled out of society and out of education for being weird or unusual in some way. Um, at the end of the century, are given uh, more in uh, inclusive mechanisms. So there are special schools, special education, special needs education is starting to come into place by the 1890s. Uh, in the 1890s, the big advance is that you start um, education for people who, um, who, who don't obviously benefit from that. Um, so development is not a prerequisite for education. So in other words, we've got a massive amount of school um, an investment in school in a, from a state that doesn't usually invest in things. So, so in, in, in many ways, it's a laissez-faire, this liberalization process is a laissez-faire um, development in, um, in society. But the big exception is that, of this is people. And what does that say to us? That tells us a large number of things, but amongst other things, school is part of the state's attention to people, to populations, and how to manage them.